like economic inequality, also get reinforced by all sorts of biases that may be implicit or explicit. And for that reason, I think that places like Los Andes play a pivotal role uh, when thinking about a more equal academic environment across the, world, the globe. And when I mean pivotal, I mean we are kind of a crucial link in the sense that we have this privileged access to academia in the most advanced nations, but we also are in the periphery and have also access uh, to places that typically do not get uh, the conditions to the advancement of science. So I think we are, or at least we should be, kind of like a hinge uh, that can bring two parts together into, into, into a functioning whole and can open new doors. So I think I see that as our responsibility. And in fact, I'm so convinced about this that one often hears in discussions in this university, and I'm sure that my colleagues from Latin America uh, in leading institutions that are uh, here with us have, have had similar experiences, that when we're discussing issues about the university management or resources or whatever, someone says, well, but we are not Harvard or MIT. And my response always is, oh no, yes, we are the Harvard or the MIT of Colombia, and we should aim to be the, one of the MITs of Latin America. I prefer to say MIT, by the way, uh, rather than Harvard. Uh, so in that sense, I think this conference falls in line with that. It has, it has been a great opportunity to do exactly that, to play a pivotal role in which we recognize that being in the global south and having access and connections to the global north is a unique opportunity to bring people, topics, uh, issues, uh, that need to uh, and deserve more attention and deserve more resources and to draw bridges that help reduce those gaps. So therefore, thank you again, you know, wider to, for letting us continue working on this direction. And in fact, SEDE is working on initiatives along these lines, which I cannot tell you about, but uh, expect some news very soon uh, on that. So I won't talk much more because having officially ended uh, the you know, wider development conference and the Congreso Economia Colombiana, we now have an uh, impossible to, 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 to uh, impossible a better event to end these three exciting de days with Daron Asimoglu offering the annual development lecture. Uh, so we will have during the session a proper introduction to our extremely uh, distinguished guest, but I cannot help saying a couple of things just in the spirit of appreciation for, uh, uh, towards Daron for joining us. Um, Daron, I think, has been uh, an inspiration for so many economists. Uh, he has opened new avenues of research along so many dimensions that uh, I wouldn't list here. I'm just going to share an anecdote. When Carlos and Kunal suggested, well, we want the discussion to be someone from Los Andes, and they kindly suggested this. Uh, and then I went to Marcela. I said, Marcela, you should be the discussion to that own lecture. And Marcela said, no, 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 you should be, Leopoldo. It's much more closer to your research. I said, no, 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 it's not that part of the Laron's research. It's much closer to your research. Uh, and that might have happened with many other of my colleagues on areas that neither of us work on. So really, uh, you have been um, uh, such influence, uh, so influential in so many areas uh, that I think it's really um, uh, great to have you here. But second, I want to emphasize that Daron has not only been uh, a professor, uh, uh, has been a professor in the fullest and the best meaning on the, of the term for many people, probably thousands um, uh, that have, uh, well, probably millions that have read his, uh, his, his books and lectures, and probably hundreds but now that have directly had the privilege, like, like I've been in that position, of being uh, directly uh, mentored and, and, and taught by him. Uh, and Daron is simply an outlier in ways perhaps even bigger than he is in terms of his research uh, output in how he devotes with generosity uh, uh, his uh, energy uh, to promoting his and, and helping and advising his students. And since, as I said before, the Congreso Colombiano de Economía is all about that, investing and believing in our students, I think there's no better uh, person giving this lecture than Daron. So this is just in the way of saying to you, Daron, that really my deepest gratitude for joining us. And thank you again, everyone, and you know why, especially for this amazing conference. Thank you very much. Can I have some light here, please? Thanks very much. So welcome to the wider and annual lecture 20 to 6 to be provided by Daron Achimoglu, in the name of progress, will technology solve inequality? I'm Kunalson, the director of any wider, and I'm chairing the annual lecture today. I would first like to introduce those of you who are new to a UNI wider event, to the United Nations University and to UNI wider. 
The United Nations University was established in 1975 to act as a research arm of the United Nations. UniWIDA, the World Institute for Development Economics Research, was the first research institute of the university back in 1985. Today, UniWIDA serves as a, as a unique blend of a think tank, research institute, and UN agency. This event is our 26th annual lecture. The lectures have been delivered by a prestigious line of scholars and policymakers, four of whom are Nobel laureates. It's a pleasure to welcome Darren Achimoglu to that lineup. Today's lecture will run for approximately 50 minutes, followed by comments by our discussant for the lecture, Marcela Aslava. Afterwards, I'll return to chair the Q&A, and I think we'll have about 30 minutes for the q and I'm delighted that this lecture is being live streamed with a large virtual audience, along with all of us, all of you here today. If you're watching on the YouTube stream virtually, you can submit questions directly on YouTube or tweet us at UniWider with hashtag AL26. I would also like to inform you that this lecture will be recorded and the recording will be added on UniWider's YouTube channel in the coming days. I would now like to introduce the wider annual lecture for 2022. Daron Achimoglu is Institute Professor of MIT and elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the British Academy of Sciences, the Turkish Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Economic Society, the European Economic Association, and the Society for, of Labor Economists. He's also a member of the Group of 30. Darren is the author of five books, including the New York Times bestseller, Why Nations Fail, Power, Prosperity, and Poverty, joined with, joined with, joined with James Robinson, a book that has become compulsory reading to all the American scholars and practitioners. I can't imagine any of us here haven't read the book. He's also, of course, there's a text, wonderful textbook that he has, Introduction to Modern Economic Growth, and along with that also The Narrow Corridor, which was published more recently, State Society, The Fate of Liberty, again with James Robinson. Daron has published over 140 journal papers, and several of his papers had huge impact on the profession. His 2001 AER paper, The Colonial Origins of Comparative Development, has received a stunning 16,000 citations. It's one of the most cited papers in economics. Darren has made path-breaking contributions to a wide range of areas, including political economy, economic development, economic growth, technological change, inequality, labor economics, and the economics of networks. His lecture today is in the interface of technological change, inequality, and labor economics. He's also a highly influential public intellectual with regular columns in Project Syndicate and other media outlets. Darren has received the inaugural T.W. Schultz Prize for the University of Chicago, in 2004, the inaugural Sherwin Rosen Award for Outstanding Contribution to Labor Economics. In 2004, the John Bates Clark Medal in 2005, the John, Newman, John Newman, Newman Award, and the Jean-Jacques Jean Lafont Prize in 2018, among many other prizes. It's a great honor for us to have Daron Achimoglu provide the wider and lecture 26. I would also like to welcome the discussant, Marcela Eslava. Marcela Eslava is a professor and dean of economics at our host institution here, Universidad Los Andes, a fellow of the Economic Society and vice president 2020 to 2023, as well as president for 2024 to 2025 of the Latin American and Caribbean Economic Association. Her current research interests revolve around the lack of inclusive growth in Latin America. We heard wonderful insights from Marcela yesterday uh, with a focus on firm, firm dynamics, productivity, as well as informality. Marcela Slava's research has been published in leading academic journals. She's been involved in multiple initiatives, research projects, and missions led by multilateral organizations and the Colombian government to contribute to understanding the origins of the deficit inclusive, inclusive growth in the region and to devise solutions to it. Now, moving on to the annual lecture. The annual lecture is based on Darren Achimoglu's newest book, In the Name of Progress, Our Thousand Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity, co authored with James, uh, Simon, uh, Simon Johnson. Uh, challenges the techno-optimism of our age and of our academic profession, which maintains that technology advances ultimately benefit society at large. As we move to ever-increasing use of digital technologies, especially in the wake of the pandemic, the lecture asks what is perhaps the most crucial question of our times. Will technology deliver shared prosperity, prosperity to the citizens of the world, or will it simply accentuate inequality within and across countries? I would now like to invite Darren Achimoglu to deliver the wider Allen Lecture 26. Darren, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for those wonderful introductions. Uh, I think after those, everything I do will be downhill, so I'm not, not sure. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. You don't want to build up expectations too much. Uh, it's my true pleasure to be here to give the annual wider lecture in this wonderful conference, in this wonderful university and lovely town. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> thanks to all of you for being here. So I'm going to talk about power and progress, our thousand year struggle over technology and prosperity. It is very much on the topic of inequality, uh, but much of the emphasis in the, uh, in the conference has been rightly on persistent inequality in the developing world, for example, Latin America. I'm going to change the focus a little bit and talk about increasing inequality and non-shared nature of prosperity in the developed world. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, this is actually uh, the theme of a new book by myself and Simon Johnson. It used to be called In the Name of Progress, but uh, the book has not changed. It's exactly the same, but the title has been changed by the publishers to Power and Progress, so that's the title. Uh, so, without further ado, let me just jump in. In 1791, Jeremy Bentham proposed the Panopticon as an efficiency-enhancing monitoring system. In a well-lit circular room, a centrally placed guard can look over uh, and monitor what the prisoners are doing, either in terms of work or security. Thanks to its resonance in popular culture, Michel Foucault and the Guardians of the Galaxy included, you know, Panopticon is an ever-present uh, contraption in our lives. But actually, the person who dreamt of it was not Jeremy Bentham, was his brother, Samuel Bentham. He was working uh, in St. Petersburg in a uh, factory uh, by, owned by the Tsar. And he came up with this idea as a way of monitoring the workers. And Jeremy's contribution was seeing this as a broader efficiency-enhancing device and publicizing it. For example, I won't read the quote, but it sort of captures his view. This is such a wonderful thing, it's going to be revolutionary in all sorts of places, hospitals, schools, manufacturing facilities, and of course prisons. To Bentham, this was all in the name of progress. If something improved efficiency, society should welcome it with open arms. There was an undercurrent that if something improves efficiency, and he thought that better monitoring would certainly do so, more information for the employers, why not? This would somehow be beneficial for everybody. And, but Bentham's philosophy, as you know, the utilitarianism, even if some people were losers, not that important, we sum across their utilities, and still something like this, efficiency improvement, must be accepted. And in this, Bentham was not alone. Uh, many of the famous philosophers of the late 18th, early 19th centuries were of the same view. Adam Smith, of course, much more famous among economists for many uh, path-breaking contributions, was very much of the same opinion, even though in some domains his thinking was more nuanced. For example, Adam Smith, although he didn't talk about industrialization per se that much, he talked about many components of it, and he felt compelled in, why nations, in, uh, in the wealth of nations to take on the idea that better technology might be bad for workers. Again, I'm not going to read the full quote, but the, he goes on through the argument that, well, you know, you save labor, that might be bad for workers. You can produce the same amount with fewer employees, but at the end of the day, the efficiency improvements are going to be good for the real price of labor, and it should rise considerably. David Ricardo, the other great towering figure, was of the same opinion. He uh, argued so in the first two editions of his uh, Monumental Principles. He uh, argued in parliamentary debates. He was an MP uh, against uh, concerns related to the Luddism that, you know, uh, he couldn't imagine how technological improvements would be bad for workers on the whole. Uh, but later on, he actually changed his mind, and that's sort of interesting. So perhaps we're following a little bit in David Ricardo's uh, footsteps. He wrote, if machinery could do all the work that labor now does, there would be no demand for labor. So he thought there were some concerns, and uh, the third edition of his principles was, was quite different. Modern thinking completely turns back, uh, <coughs> turns its back to Ricardo, 
<coughs> and it's very much along the lines of Adam Smith's thinking. Of course, in macroeconomics, labor economics, development economics, there's a huge literature on inequality, but many of the approaches that we have developed, at least in the medium run, sort of confirm Adam Smith and Bentham's ideas. If something is efficiency improving, it should be generally useful. In fact, uh, this is completely ingrained in the models that we use. <coughs> in Cobb Douglas models, by fiat, unless you go into labor market imperfections, which I'll go a little bit uh, later on, you're going to have labor and capital share constants, so if something improves the size of the pie, labor as a whole benefits. Perhaps within labor there might be some small groups, but most people think, well, that might be a transitory phenomenon, but again, on utilitarian grounds, yeah, things probably are going to be good. In economics, we of course don't contain ourselves with Cobb-Douglas production functions. We can go to other neoclassical constant returns through, to scale production functions with uh, competitive labor markets, competitive factor markets. You get more or less the same sort of conclusions that generally technological change of any sort is going to be beneficial for labor. And in economics, we tend to sort of think of Luddism as a sort of a derogatory term. If you, in a seminar, if you accuse somebody of, or if you say that somebody's a Luddite, that's not, that's not a good thing. So the, the view that progress, some sort of efficiency enhancing progress, is, is going to be beneficial and we shouldn't sort of question it, I think is you know, not completely accepted universally, but it's fairly, fair, fairly general. In fact, so interesting that these effects in aggregative macro models, labor models, are so pervasive, they don't even have a name. It's so ingrained that we didn't even think as economists to give them a name. But for a broad audience, Simon and I had to come with a name, and we came with the name of a productivity bandwagon. You improve the, you improve the productivity, and then that, as a bandwagon, pulls most people who are on it. There could be short-term disruption, but most people will ultimately benefit. And a good summary of that view is given not by an economist, perhaps, but by co LinkedIn and uh, uh, PayPal co-founder, Reid Huffman. Could we have a bad 20 years? Absolutely. But if you are working towards progress, your future will be better than your past, your present, sorry. So this is the view. But this view, very much Benthamite and Smithian, was not shared by workers in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. Fortunately, we know Britain has very good records of petitions, letters, uh, parliamentary uh, commissions. So we have very detailed information of what the workers thought. And they thought nothing like Bentham and Smith. They thought this was a horrible time. They were being exploited. The, the cards were stacked against them. They complained about the fact that machines were taking their jobs. Luddites were not alone. They complained about wage, wages declining, hard work work getting harder. They complain about every aspect of the new production system. So for example, here is one from one petition from a weaver. No man would like to work in a power loom. They do not like it. There is such clattering and noise. It would almost make some man mad. Next, he would have to subject to a discipline that a hand loom weaver can never submit to. Automation, or what we call today automation, or many contemporaries would have called mechanization, uh, was a particular point, sore point. I am determined for my part that if they will invent machines to supersede manual labor, they must find iron boys to mine them. We don't have perfect data from this period, but by and large they were right. From 1750 to about 1840s, there is almost no growth in the real earnings of British workers. Some regions show growth, there's some movements up and down, but overall no growth. But during the same time period, industrial workers' working hours increased by about 20%. So their real wages almost surely fell by quite significant amounts. Working conditions completely changed, and for the worse. Workers had a lot of autonomy. Wasn't a great system for them in the, uh, the putting out system or other home-based production uh, structures were not great, but at least by their own accounts, the, um, the additional discipline what Bentham wanted but did not actually achieve in terms of the panopticon was pretty bad for them. And, of course, the concentration of people in cities, 
much worse health conditions, much worse pollution, all of these were adding up. This is not an isolated incident. There are many other defining transitions over the last several hundreds of years, or our thousand years, which paint a very similar picture. The Dark Ages are, were not dark in most senses. They were actually quite innovative. There were many new agricultural methods, new technologies introduced, windmills especially, uh, and productivity increased quite significantly during many episodes. But for much of this period, peasants had almost no improvements in their living standards except during uh, episodic events. Advances in the, in the European ship design were critical for growth commerce during this time period, but of course they were also the same technologies that were fueled and enabled the transportation of millions of people as slaves from Africa to the New World. So another very clear example of, uh, of ma major efficiency improving technological innovations from which not everybody benefited. In fact, some very clearly delineated groups became clear losers. The introduction of steam engine was absolutely critical, as critical as the textile machinery, but the steam engines for the first 80 years or so were used mostly in coal mines for pumping water. And their immediate effect was that you could dig into deeper coal mines, and if you go into deeper coal mines, that's very expensive, and employers came up with a perfect way. You're gonna use children to do that job. Children as young as five were sent to incredibly dangerous conditions, and at the end of the 18th century, the, uh, about 20% of most coal mines workforce were underage children. And they had tremendous health hazards, uh, complete uh, lack of education, and, uh, and, 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 and often death out of that. The cotton gin, let me mention one more, uh, was another completely revolutionary technology. Uh, US could not even produce its own cotton, let alone export cotton. And then after Eli Whitney's cotton gin, although there were other prototypes before Eli Whitney's, uh, they could uh, essentially apply it to the tougher southern cotton, led to a huge cotton boom. US became the world's leading cotton exporter and was a critical part of US uh, economic development in the 19th century. But the cotton gin also meant that uh, slaves who were uh, in more dispersed and uh, working under less harsh conditions, we were moved to the more delta regions, deeper south, under much, much harsher, much more greater punishment-based uh, production methods. Again, very clear losers from efficiency. So, this, I would say, is not just of historical interest. It's not something that we can turn our back on and say, today, in, in uh, industrialized nations, these things are just memories. Today, we are going through a period of rapid efficiency-enhancing technological changes, led by digital technologies, but also biotech and, uh, <coughs> and, and other high technology, high investment sectors. But in the midst of this, we are seeing a complete remaking of the distribution structure of industrialized nations, led by the US, but not confined to the US. For example, the US labor share, which hovered around two thirds for 80 years at least, perhaps for longer, shows a remarkable decline, almost 10 percentage point decline. And this is not composition, this is uh, not because some industries are, new industries are more capital intensive. The red line here is cap composition adjusted, you see exactly the same. Even more striking is the concurrent changes in wage structure in the United States. This picture shows the real wage evolution of 10 demographic groups distinguished by gender and education, all the way from workers without a high school degree in dark red to those with more than a college, a postgraduate degree in dark blue. And you see that from the 1960s onwards, uh, for about 15 years, you have this period of shared prosperity where all 10 groups are experiencing more or less the same growth in their real wages. 
This picture starts in 1963 because before then you cannot distinguish college graduates and non-college graduates and that distinction is rather important for certain things. But if you extend it back by just looking at college graduates, you see the same thing going back to 1945. Remarkable wage growth and if anything actually faster at the bottom of the distribution than the top. But then from 1980s, around 1980 onwards, you see a complete sea change. Inequality increases quite significantly, but most jarring is the fact that while wages at the top continue to increase, those for low education workers, especially men, but to some degree women as well, is declining. There's a quite significant decline in the real earnings of, say, high school graduate men. If you are a high school dropout in the United States today, if you're a high school dropout men, you're in the United States today, you are almost surely earning quite a lot less than your father did. This type of bottom of the wage distribution collapsing is essentially unique to the United States because this is the country where you don't have much protection for workers, minimum wages, union bargaining or norms against uh, very high wa wage inequality. But wages at the bottom have been stagnant pretty much in all industrialized nations and inequality in various dimensions of inequality here summarized by the Gini coefficient has increased pretty much everywhere. Moreover, the nature of work has changed in quite parallel fashion. So here again, I'm showing it for industrialized nations. This, the previous picture, of course, is not the same for Latin America, where inequality is higher but declining in a few places. This one is actually similar also in, the, in, in, in Latin America. Jobs you would identify as the middle class, and here in this uh, classified as those in the middle occupations that are in the middle third of the wage distribution, they have been disappearing pretty much everywhere in the industrialized world. And of course, no surprise, these are blue collar jobs and clerical office, back office jobs. There are many fewer of those, in some places replaced by more technical jobs, especially with the educational upgrading. In some places, the replaced by much worse quality jobs, security, food preparation, uh, and so on. Now, in interpreting all of these facts and the broader optimistic view of what technology does, I think the perspective of economists is shaped by two factors. One is what I've already mentioned, the sort of idea that if something is efficiency improving, it's going to increase the pie. Somehow the market process is going to ensure that the gains are shared. The second is that, of course, we have many models that recognize the importance of choice, endogenous uh, technology models or other endogenous uh, choice models. But I think on the whole, in many of these debates, how malleable technology is, how manipulable its direction is, is often ignored. This is the basis for Again, a reaction that I have been, I've been working on these topics uh, for over 10 years now. I mean, they go back to things I was working on in my dissertation, but much more actively over the last 10 years. And the criticism that I hear often is, but being critical of the current direction of technology is essentially a way of being anti-technology and that's dangerous and that's bad. It's a form of Luddism. And I think the basis of that sort of view is that, well, because you cannot manipulate and change the direction of technology very much, criticizing technology is the same as saying, the criticizing the current direction of technology is the same as saying, well, perhaps we don't want this technology. So choice is a very important element in how we should form a worldview about technology. So perhaps criticizing the current direction of technology should be not resisting technological change in general, but a plea for changing its direction. And why is that important? Well, that's particularly important because I'm going to argue the productivity bandwagon has its limits. And I want to highlight two of them here, although there are others that we can talk about. One, going back to the views of the 
workers in the midst of industrial revolution, automation, meaning use of machinery and increasingly algorithms for substituting for tasks that previously labor performed is very different than increasing efficiency of production uniformly or finding new things, new ways, new productivity, enhancing devices for workers. Automation has very different distributional effects. I'll also mention in a second, show you, has very different productivity effects. And it's not a type of technology that by itself going to undergird shared prosperity. Second, efficiency improvements will increase the size of the pie. But then institutional factors are going to determine how we share those gains. We can increase the size of the pie, but if the environment is coercive, for example, some things that I studied uh, with Alex Wolitsky, that greater productivity might actually lead to higher coercion and lower wages. Or rent sharing patterns might change, or they may be bad enough that the gains are not going to be shared. If the technological changes that you're talking in mind are like what Bentham imagined and what Amazon applies today, much better monitoring devices, perhaps you wouldn't be so surprised that those may not lead to sharing a lot of those gains with workers. So those are the two elements that I want to emphasize, but time is short and I want to sort of spend a little bit of my uh, time with you today on the first point, on automation. So this is an integral part of the book, but of course the book is written for a broad audience so we don't do the technical stuff. So here I'm going to do just a little bit of the technical stuff. So think of this as a way for me to propose a somewhat broader way of thinking of production structure. And to do that, I'm going to, mea culpa, I'm going to use two slides of math, but most of it I can just do it with diagrams. So in the classic way of we think about production, especially at the aggregate level, we have an aggregate production function, something shifts and then that increases output and uh, perhaps wages and employment. Instead of doing that, I want to think of production as consisting of a range of tasks. If you want to produce a piece of garment, you need to do a bunch of uh, spinning tasks, weaving tasks, design tasks, then chemical processes, then you have to do all the non-production tasks, etc. And all of these are done, then you get a piece of garment. A key decision is which task is going to be allocated with, to which factor of production. In general, think of many different types of skilled uh, and unskilled labor and different types of capital. But let me simplify it here just to capital and labor. And I'm going to assume, I'm going to put the tasks on the horizontal axis. I'm going to assume that only those to the left of some threshold I are technologically automatable. So these are the ones that we know how to automate. And then on the horizontal, on the vertical axis, I'm plotting the cost of production of that task, cost of accomplishing that task, with the two factors of production. The orange one is with capital, the rental rate of return of capital, one type of capital, divided by the productivity of capital at that task, and the blue one is the same, wage divided by labor's productivity. And then the firm's cost minimization problem is easy, choose the lower envelope. Now, in this framework, let me think about what different types of technological changes might be. So the one that economists love, you know, Uzawa theorem, balanced growth, all things work so beautifully, is labor augmenting technological change. So labor augmenting technological change would look like labor's productivity increasing everywhere. So, great. This is a wonderful thing, if it only existed. So, I don't know of any technological change that makes labor more productive in everything, but perhaps certain things might approach it. What it does is that because it's making labor more productive in everything, it creates a huge productivity effect. That's shown in that shaded blue area. What about its impact on the allocation of tasks to factors? Here, no impact. In fact, generally second order. And as a result of that, it has some distributional effect. 
but it's very tamed institutional effects. This is the reason why in the neoclassical world, technological change, efficiency enhancements do improve everybody's welfare. If you like capital augmenting, the same thing. Big integral, not much effect on the allocation of tasks. But now, none of this looks like automation. Automation would be, we introduce spinning machines or weaving machines. Now, handloom weavers are replaced by machinery. Well, that would be a shift of I to some I prime there. <coughs> when you do that, now you get something very different. First of all, the productivity effect, instead of that big integral, you get a small triangle. That triangle could be as small as possible, as small as you want, if orange and blue lines are very close together. So the efficiency implications of automation could be very mild. But it has huge distributional implications. Why? Because it displaces a lot of workers from the tasks that they used to perform. It impacts not just those workers, because those workers then go and compete for tasks that other workers were performing. So it has a generally depressing effect on wages. Now, if history was one of automation and nothing else, we would not be talking of shared prosperity and things that actually were pretty good after, say, 14, 1850s and 19th century and certainly after 1945. We wouldn't be talking of labor share being constant. In fact, it's not because of labor augmenting technological changes either, because labor augmenting technological changes don't even have the power distributionally to undo the effects of automation. Something else, <clears throat> this framework suggests, and our empirical work and our historical work sort of backs up, that, that something else is new tasks. New technologies have the capacity to introduce tasks that did not exist before in which labor can specialize. So if you think of modern economy, look at, think of most people around you, many of them perform tasks that did not exist 50 years, 60 years ago. Even those like us, professors, accountants, we are performing tasks that professors and accountants 50, 60 years ago couldn't dream of. So that's the new task that is so important for labor demand. Okay, so this is the informal thing, but I want to now tax you for two minutes by putting a little bit more flesh on the bones. So here is the math for it. There is a purpose for why I'm doing this. So think of the way that you have to perform these tasks as some CES aggregator, some aggregator, any aggregator would do. So they have these task services, you aggregate them, you produce some output. And what is the task production function that I summarize in that figure? Well, for tasks less than I, you can produce them by capital, by capital or labor. For tasks above I, you have to use I labor. That's it. That was the model. The only other thing I'm adding is this N here, which is going to be this index of new tasks. You're adding things to the right. Okay? You solve this model and express everything as a function of the labor supply and the capital stock of the economy, and you get something that looks a little bit familiar. So, AK times K to something like elasticity of substitution. So you might say, oh, well, you know, Daron just gave a micro foundation for the CES production function. But actually, it's not. Appearances can be deceptive. This thing is not a CES production function. In fact, it couldn't be farther away from it. The thing is that sigma here is endogenous. It's not a fixed parameter. It changes depending on the endogenous substitution between capital and labor. And most of the action doesn't come from AK or the sigma. It comes from these orange terms, which normally are dropped in the CES or are taken to be as given. And one way of seeing that is to focus on the key economic object that this model highlights, factor shares. So since I have two factors that just I can focus on the labor share, that thing that was like heading south before, so SL, labor share, you can write it in this form. So the blue terms are exactly what you would get from CES with a fixed sigma. It's wage relative to factor productivity. All the action has to come from this sigma. And if that sigma is not too far from one, you have to work very hard to get anything out of CES. But here, all the action is going to come from these orange terms. What are these orange terms? That's what I'm going to call the task content of production. How much of the tasks are being performed by labor, how much by capital, and automation directly impacts that. That orange term looks complicated, don't worry about it. Think of it as n minus i, approximately n minus i. That's what it is. So that orange term, the labor 
enhancing or labor friendly part of it gets de declines when there is automation, I increases, and increases when there are new tasks. So now let's look at the effects of automation on wages. So if you are a believer in the efficiency enhancing view of technology will be spread is, you can say, well, as long as automation is going to improve output, it will ultimately get shared in one way or another with labor. So let's look at that. So let me look at the measure of, oops. Ah, yeah, oh man, the delay is, okay, all right. So let me look at the measure of labor like wage bill that the corporate sector pays and see what happens to it when I change I. Well, don't look at the math, just look at the label. This is a productivity effect, that's that triangle. And this is the displacement effect. The displacement is effect completely about this orange term, that gamma that I introduced going down. And which one is larger? We don't know. In general, productivity effect could be larger, displacement effect could be larger, but let's go back to that figure. If, if I make the orange and the blue close enough together, the green triangle is small enough, so that's necessarily the displacement effect is gonna be smaller. So therefore, with automation technologies, you can have productivity improvements, capital business owners, perhaps high-skilled labor, we'll see that in a second, may benefit, but workers, especially line workers, may actually end up fairly worse off. Okay, is this all theory? Well, it is, but I hope not just theory. So one way of understanding that is to look at an uh, archetypal example of an automation technology, robots. Actually, robots are stacking the cards against funding something like a large displacement effect because they're actually very productive. I'll argue, if I have time later on, that many automation technologies that we have been enthusiastically adopting over the last 30 years are not so productive, but robots are the exception. They're actually quite productive. They have revolutionized manufacturing, especially heavy manufacturing, electronics, uh, chemicals, and cars. But if you look at their effects, they look nothing like a rising tide lifting all boats. So let me not go into the details uh, a lot, uh, but what Pasquale Restrepo and I do is we construct a measure of exposure of, to robots based on which sectors are having most robotic innovations and different local labor markets in the United States that specialize in different industries in the 1970s. So on the basis of this, we have this exposure to robots measure. We show that higher exposure to robots predicts more robot adoption, and then we look at what it implies for workers. So here are three graphs that summarize it. Each circle here is one commuting zone or a local labor market, and you see a very strong negative effect. It's showcased by places like Detroit, Lansing City, Defiance City, heavy manufacturing hubs in the Midwest. But if you leave those guys out, you get the dashed line rather than the solid line. So they're not driving the relationship, they're just bang on the regression line. This is for employment, lower employment to population ratio. This is for wages, quite significantly lower wages in places that have been adopting robots. And if you look at the distribution, say for example with a quantile regression, you find that negative effects are borne by the low wage workers. So this already gives you a hint that it's not just between capital and labor, but the broader inequality trends perhaps are going to be related to automation as well. That's something that uh, Pasquale and I turn in a more recent paper, and we change the focus away from robots to all automation technologies, so software automation, which is a very important part of it, and we look at the national labor market because a lot of inequality is not just local, but at the national level. Again, let me summarize everything with one figure. So what we do is that we construct a task displacement measure, which is loosely speaking, in the 1980, your demographic group, which could be women with low education who are young and native-born. Your demographic group, how, what fraction of the tasks that you have been performing have been taken over by automation? Which could be software automation, non-robotics, uh, manufacturing automation, or robotics automation. And then we put that on the horizontal axis, 
and then changing the real wage of that demographic group for 500 demographic groups on the vertical axis. And this is the cloud of points. If you look at the R square of this, with or without controls, it's about 70%. So a huge fraction of the inequality between groups in the United States seems to be very strongly correlated with automation. And all of those groups that you saw losing real incomes, those are below the real wages, I should have said, zero. They are all those that have heavily lost tasks to automation. So automation, of course, is nothing new. So if there is such a negative effect of automation on inequality, on the labor share, how come we don't see them in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s? Well, in a different paper, Pascual Restrepo and I look at what's the overall rate of automation and displacement caused by automation and a proxies for new tasks. So here is a summary. So here you have to make more assumptions. So this is more, a little bit more assumption based than the figures that I showed you before. But this is data from 1947 to 1987. So you have a lot of displacement and everything I've put in the labor share units because that's the key. You have a lot of automation, but at the same time you have a lot of workers being reinstated into the production process because of new tasks. So much so that the sum of those two is hovering around zero. So the two are balanced. So it's like a balanced growth path. Same thing we did in manufacturing. But now fast forward to the post-80s period, you see a very different picture. Automation accelerates, but even more remarkably, reinstatement slows down. And in manufacturing, there's almost no reinstatement. It's all automation. So, there is something technological going on that I think is very important for the new non-shared nature of economic growth. But I have not talked about rent sharing and institutions because I don't have time. But I want to also argue that these technological trends are themselves not separate from institutional changes. And to do that, I'm going to use my last 10 minutes to do a whirlwind tour of going back to the British Industrial Revolution. So, let me skip these. Okay. So, things looked like worrying, like today, during the Industrial Revolution. Many workers not benefiting, capital business owners benefiting, and workers not doing so. Why, why was that happening? Well, looked at it from this perspective, two major reasons. One is institutional. Workers couldn't organize. In fact, trade unions were illegal. There were still master and servant acts that made it illegal for workers to quit their employers. And Britain was an aristocracy, oligarchy, without any democratic counterweight. And early technological change had a strong automation bias. This is what most employers were interested in, in textiles and in some of the associated industries. That's what some of these workers were complaining about, as I said. Why did things change in the, from 1840s onwards? Well, I think both of these elements started changing. First of all, technology. New industries and new technologies, even in some of the existing industries, took a very different direction. There are many reasons for that. I don't have time to get into it. Railways is emblematic of one of them. Railways were very worried about low productivity of workers, so they, from early on, experimented with many methods, but panopticon and things like that wouldn't work. They went for efficiency wages. So railways are much more into sharing the benefits with workers. But even more importantly, Many industries went in a direction of trying to increase the productivity of low-skilled workers. This is most emblematic in the U.S. and associated with the Habakkuk hypothesis. U.S. had a very steep shortage of skilled labor. And that was what people kept talking about in the 1830s, 1840s. And then they came up with a solution. New technologies, interchangeable parts being one part of it, which were trying to reorganize work in order to increase the 
productivity of unskilled labor. And then these technologies then spread from the US very quickly to the UK, Canada, and, and Europe. So this is the Habakkuk force that changed the nature of technology in a much less automation, more worker-friendly direction. But the institutional changes were no less sweeping. Democratization was a huge deal. Civil service reforms, you know, British cities were places you wouldn't want to be in. And they all got cleaned up, but part of it because the civil service got on the case, and civil service got on the case because state capacity was much higher already in the 1850s. But also, worker power increased. So collective bargaining, trade unions became, uh, becoming legal was one of the major part of the chartist reform questions that happened in 1871. But even after 1871, there were cases against collective bargaining attempts under the master and servant laws, and those were repealed in 1877. The broader forces are actually captured by an early radical, John Telwell, who is often associated also with the Luddite movement. And in fact, it shows that the Luddite movement wasn't just break the machines. They were asking for a different social contract. And, and what Telwell said, you know, you know, this accumulation of capital that you're seeing, all the inequality, but it is bringing something else. It's bringing workers together and new ideas. Hence, every large workshop manufacturer is sort of a political society, which no act of parliament can silence and no magistrate can disperse. These were, of course, imperfect steps. Britain, the US, don't look like happy, shared prosperity societies in the uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the late 19th century, but the, the sort of the Habakkuk path of technology continued. Again, this is a large part of the book, but I don't have time to go into it today, but there was a lot of effort at increasing worker productivity, creating new tasks throughout British and American, especially American industry. Uh, and again, it was sort of bolstered by worker power. And worker power took a very interesting form. In many places, you know, it went wrong. Unions sometimes blocked technology, but many union leaders, not all, many union leaders also understood that what they had to do was not to block technology, to resist technology, but to actually try to steer the direction of technology. UAW in its heyday was very successful in this, against GM, against Ford. We offer our cooperation a common search for policies and programs that will ensure that greater technological progress will result in greater human progress. And what they emphasize is you want to create new tasks, new training opportunities for low-skill workers. And there were many successes, but then things went wrong. Why did they go wrong? Many reasons. This failure has many fathers. But I think no part of it can be told without digital technologies. And again, this is both a qualitative account, but also quantitatively. I've showed you again, if you believe it, that 70%, 50 to 70% of the inequality is related to a subset of digital technologies, the automation technologies. So how come? Why? Why digital technologies? In fact, if you look at the ideology of digital technologies early on, this is not what you would have expected. The early pioneers of digital technology, some of them at Berkeley, some of them at MIT, were very much opposed to big corporations. The, this is quoting from one of them. Industrial approach is grim. It doesn't work. The design motto is designed by geniuses for use by idiots. And the watchword for dealing with the untrained, unwashed public is keep their hands off. This is what they were against. They thought digital technologies would be liberating for workers, liberating for citizens. It would destroy IBM. IBM was the organization they hated most. And, and it would sort of create much more basis for actively participating citizenry and shared prosperity. At the end, the opposite happened. Institutional changes, a new ideology among businesses in the shape of Fred Friedman doctrine, union movements completely being decimated, lack of countervailing powers, but very importantly, the next generation of digital leaders completely swallowed hook, line, and sinker the idea of IBM. We're going to produce big machinery so that companies can monitor workers, automate some part of it, gives the control to managers rather than the workers. So that's the direction in which the digital technologies went. Now again, uh, I can get, go into the details, 
with some more evidence. But let me just show you one thing, because I think this might be fun, and people may not have seen it from some new work that I have done with Alex He and uh, Daniel Lemaire. One place where you can see the Friedman Doctrine, we argue, is in business schools. And so what do business schools do? Well, we argue, it turns out, that if you have a manager who graduates from a business school in the US and in Denmark, this is for the US, what they do is they cut wages. So nothing before, a new CEO with a business school degree comes in, wages decline, labor share declines. Well, perhaps they are doing that while at the same time increasing the pie. No, output doesn't increase, employment and investment doesn't increase, exports don't increase. You see the same pattern in Denmark. Nothing before the business school CEO comes in, thereafter, wage declines. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I don't think business schools explain much, much of what's going on, but it's emblematic of a new ideology without countervailing powers that was, I think, part of how the direction of technology got, uh, uh, got dislocated. Well, uh, I'm almost at the end of my 50 minutes, so let me just say two more things. One is artificial intelligence, all of the things I've shown so far is pre-AI, but artificial intelligence is continuing and perhaps amplifying the trends that we are seeing with digital technologies. And I think it's doing so again because it's embedded in an institutional structure that elevates automation rather than improving worker productivity, and it's also embedded in an ideological structure. And in fact, the very word machine intelligence and uh, artificial intelligence are, in my view, just telltale sign of that. What you should want is not machine intelligence, what we argue is machine usefulness. What you want are machines that are useful to people, not intelligent machines. And in fact, this is not one criticism that I get, from, including from some of my closest co-authors, oh, this is all well and good, but can you really redirect technological change? Is there really an, a possibility that things like artificial intelligence or digital technologies, more capable machines, could actually be used for improving what human productivity does? Well, both historically and today, the answer is yes. The, some of the early luminaries of the field, I think those that had a much better idea than, uh, than than, than, than the ones that are followed by the current AI field, actually had exactly that view. People like Norbert Wiener, Douglas Engelbart, J. S. R. Licklider, and some of the most important uh, digital innovations came out of that approach of machine usefulness. And, uh, and the opposite of that is exactly what the early hackers described as the IBM approach. You use digital technologies to control humans, to monitor them to do the things that they used to do. That's a very different vision. Now, since the crowd here is very interested in development, actually, let me say this is bad news for development as well. I think for developing countries, as uh, Jacob is here, Jacob's wonderful work is on this also, on uh, inappropriate technologies, I think have been a very major problem. And in some sense, artificial intelligence, by automating white-collar work, uh, again, moving in that direction, slowly albeit, moving in that direction, I think could be the mother of all inappropriate technologies because it's going exactly in the direction of using things, capital, skilled labor, programming that are scarce in the developing world and not using the resource that the developing world has, which is abundant labor. So it will be a force for within country and between country inequality. And then finally, all of these technologies make things much harder because they have also impacted the nature of democracy. And the, the way that they have done that is actually not a separate phenomenon, I, I, we, we argue in the book. It's part of the same ensemble. If you have a business model of top-down technologies and technologies for control, it lends itself very easily for monetization based on ads and data collection. And that is the nexus that we argue uh, is at the, at the root of, uh, of uh, uh, of, of a lot of the democracy troubles. And redirecting technological change, again, is feasible. The examples I have given are, uh, are telling on that, but another one that we see is renewable technology. This is, I think, you know, not much for us to be happy about in the environment, climate change realm, but there's one thing we should take pride in, which is that even a very small amount of government and societal pressure led to a huge 
redirection of technological change. More than 20, 30 fold declines in solar and wind costs. And the, you have to look at the book if you're interested for our arguments of why the same is feasible in the realm of digital technologies. Let me conclude here. Thank you very much for uh, spending this 50 minutes with me. Thank you. Well, let me start by thanking Daron for uh, one for being here, uh, two for a, what really was a wonderful lecture, illuminating as always, um, inspiring as well, and also thank uh, Leopoldo, Carlos, and and Kumar as because as as you guys already said, um, that discussion uh, led me to me being here. Um, so what I want to do today uh, is to place the light a little bit more on, on the final words uh, that Daron gave, gave us and, and try to think a little bit more of the, uh, from the standpoint of, of developing economies. Of course, what uh, Daron just gave us is a very convincing and fair challenges to, uh, to this idea of what he called the productivity bandwagon uh, idea, the idea that uh, productivity growth will bring all the good uh, edges that we need. Um, he uh, plays the light on two main things uh, to, that talk about the limitations of productivity growth. One is uh, the fact that um, the prevalence of automatization uh, places challenges for uh, the, the absorption of the uh, less uh, privileged workers, but also the fact that there is uh, poor uh, rent sharing. Of course, all of these worsened in the era of digitalization for all the reasons that Daron mentioned, but let me also add, uh, because of the great gains that uh, digitalization brings for the scale of corporations uh, through the fact that uh, they rely on networks and the need for uh, these big, let me call them, mutualities. Uh, of course, this does place uh, a challenge for the idea that technological uh, adoption and progress may be uh, inequality reducing and does help us uh, answer the questions that we're all together here uh, to, to answer. But of course, as, as Daron said, his focus has been especially in these technologically leading countries. And at the end, he pointed that this may be even worse for uh, economists such as the ones that are of most interest to people here because of their labor, labor abundance and the great perils that automatization uh, does brings. The other feature that I wanted to highlight um, is, is how crucial labor and social protection in general, uh, the welfare state, um, uh, has been to lessen uh, the problem. So, so let me pick up on, on some of these points and ask what, what's in there for developing economies. And I would say the, the problem is even more complicated for developing economies because as all of these things matter for these economies, exactly in the way that Duran said, they may matter even more. We also have the problem uh, that rather than the main issue being that this uh, developing slash adopting firms um, exploiting their workers or shedding out their workers, the main problem in developing economies is that we never had the absorption of uh, workers by firms that had already adopted or developed uh, technologies that allow them to, um, uh, to even think of uh, paying um, high incomes to their workers. The problem, let me emphasize, is not that brain sharing is better, or the feature that I wanted to emphasize, is not that brain sharing is better in these countries, and that's the reason we don't have to worry that, that much about automatization of the, or the, or the um, 
uh, or, the, or the rent sharing problem. In fact, uh, markdowns are high in our countries. Here are some data for China, China here are some uh, data for Chile. Uh, and in fact, the larger corporations also pay larger, uh, lower uh, wages, that is to say, they have uh, larger markdowns. But rather, the problem that I wanted to highlight is that rent sharing becomes less relevant. Because as I said in the beginning, less workers are being absorbed by firms which with, uh, with which they have the chance to bargain. So the numbers I wanted to bring here uh, to emphasize this point are these. Uh, if you look at these more developed economies in, in this chart, uh, the vast majority of workers are in firms um, here exemplified by firms of 10 or more workers, the, the typical technology adopters will be in the higher end of the firm size distribution. Instead, in uh, Latin American countries here, the, the only uh, countries for which I have numbers uh, among the developing, uh, in the developing world, that is the vast mi minority of workers uh, that are absorbed by these types of firms. Instead, a very large fraction of workers here are self-employed, and that is even worse for the workers uh, for which the inequality problem is uh, more problematic in these countries. Because, sorry, I'm also having trouble here, okay. Because, one interest, the other interesting feature of inequality in this country, the other, the other uh, distinguishing feature, is the fact that we not only are more unequal, but inequality is more dominated by poverty rather than just by a very far and dense uh, upper tail of the income distribution. Um, sorry, that's, there's a little bit of a, of a delay. So, um, This is not a problem, uh, as you may think, that in the late years we have adopted technologies that are very automatized and therefore we have shed a lot of uh, the workers out. This has been a problem that has been prevalent for very many years. There has been an anti-job creation bias uh, by firms, even pre the new era of uh, automatization and digitalization. Uh, here are some numbers for what the manufacturing share of employment and value added has been over the process of development. Um, it's, it's very hard to distinguish the two lines, but, uh, but in all countries, the line that is uh, farther above is the share of total value added that's represented by manufacturing. And the other line is the share of employment that is uh, represented by manufacturing. And whereas in uh, richer economies, especially at the peak of industrialization, the share that manufacturing meant for employment and for value added was very similar. Developing countries here, again, exemplified by Latin America here, uh, Colombia in particular, have generated much less employment uh, from, from, the, from the start. So um, what I want to bring with these numbers is uh, the additional issue that we have to deal with in, in uh, these economies. Uh, that uh, while all the perils that Daron mentioned are very, very much there and uh, very much represent a danger, there is an additional danger uh, of an anti-technology bias in a set of regions where technology has not even gotten there and has not been able to generate the value that, uh, that uh, at some point did create the prosperity that uh, the more developed economies uh, saw. Let me also mention a similar or a related point uh, regarding the welfare state social protection uh, more, uh, more generally understood. Uh, and this is of course a, a, an issue that was raised yesterday uh, in the policy panel. Uh, while, while labor protection is indeed central, and central when we have the rent sharing problems uh, that have been pointed at uh, today, um, there is also the question of how we combine uh, social protection with 
technological progress and more general with uh, the kind of growth that developing economies definitely uh, need. And so there is the question of how do you fund social protection when you have not gone through the, uh, through the wealth increases that, in, that uh, allowed for that social protection to arise in the countries uh, that Daron told us about uh, some minutes ago. Um, so I leave you with that open question. And uh, let me move now to the uh, Q&A. Kunal, I think, was going to go. Sorry? So we heard an amazing lecture and really interesting observations from Marcella. And, and now I know that a lot of you ask, want to ask questions, both to Darren Alt, but also to Marcella. Uh, so let's get started. And what I want to do is take three questions, so that's okay, Darren, and uh, 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 to take three questions from the audience here. One from here, one from here, and one from there. So you get <laughs> parity <laughs> into the questions. So let's start from this side. And just put your hands up, wait for uh, the, the, our colleagues with microphones. Sanjay, I can see you for the first person to ask questions. Go ahead. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Maybe you want to introduce yourself also. Uh, I'm Santiago Levy, Darren. Thank you so much for the lecture. So, on, on the empirical part that you show, which you show in the sort of the latter years, the reinstatement effect being so negative that in the end the labor share is coming down. A question is, how do you disentangle the productivity and technology part that you're emphasizing vis-a-vis -vis international trade? What, what could I say, look, no, 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 you're not really measuring that. What you're really measuring is NAFTA plus China plus whatever. I, I don't know that. Uh, and then one observation, which is uh, connected to Marcela. I really like the emphasis on, at the end of the day, the sharing depends on the political institutions by which workers you know, have power or no power. But in our countries, with more than 60, 50% of the labor force unorganized, the political power of labor is very weak because they're very, very dispersed. So that's yet another argument. If in the future the gains from productivity are gonna be shared more equally, we need different political institutions by which workers need to organize to get the wins. So a question and an observation. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Santiago. Question from here? There's a question there. Keep your hand up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very nice, as always. So uh, a com theoretical comment first. So uh, regarding the, the choice of technology, you have like two um, optimality issues. The first one is if you have a, a, a planner, the planner is going to choose the technology which maximizes uh, output, uh, and then uh, you know you, you you share the the output. But when you have firms choosing the technology, maybe they choose the technology which ma maximizes capital income. So then you have one problem, and the second problem is then by this choice, you, you change uh, income distribution. So uh, I would want to hear uh, an analysis of that. that um, the second one is you may have, let's say you talk about the, the purely technological e distributional issue and then the institutional issue. But in my view, and I'm not sure if I'm right, these uh, labor saving innovations have the effect of uh, reducing uh, bargaining power of the workers, basically because they are less needed. Uh, so I, I want to know if you have uh, studied these, these issues. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, let's have a question from this side of the, of the audience, the, on my right. Anyone from that side? Okay, Leopold, I think. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to ask a very short but obvious question, perhaps. I want to know if those business uh, school managers increase the manager wages. You should tell us that. <laughs> the manager wages, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well, let me first say thanks to Marcella as well. I think those are exactly right, your points. Uh, let me make two comments, uh, and that's why the book is focused on the 
technologically leading countries, because I think the problem for the emerging world or the middle income world is much harder. So both the type of social protection that is needed is becoming harder and harder, especially when these countries are being squeezed more and more by both technology and trade. And, uh, and, and second, uh, you know, most emerging economies don't have control, as much control over the choice of technology. So even if you buy everything, I've said, and some people may not, you know, the extent to which, say, Colombia as a country or the Colombian business has a choice over the direction of technology is significantly less than American or German firms. And that's going to be a really complicating factor. Put that together with the difficulty of building missing institutions, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. Uh, the, uh, the three comments were all excellent, and, and I think uh, they're all, uh, they all require detailed answers. Well, except Leopoldo's, I gave it already, not detailed. Uh, they, increase, they increase shareholder values. They increase share repurchases, dividends, and managers' wages. Uh, so uh, that's a first-order question. That your question applies both to that displacement and reinstatement figures. It applies to the robots evidence, and it applies to the inequality evidence on the task displacement. And from a statistical point of view, it turns out that. Trade with China is fairly orthogonal. It's a curious pattern, but when you think about it, a lot of that was in the low value added sectors, such as apparel, uh, furniture, toys. Whereas much of automation, both software and uh, equipment robots, is much more in the high value added sectors. Uh, now, in terms of the inequality patterns that I showed you, there, there is the other aspect of globalization, offshoring. So I took credit for offshoring there. So actually what I showed you on the horizontal axis was both offshoring and automation. And I see offshoring very related to automation, but quantitatively it's about one-tenth of automation. So if I didn't do that, it, the numbers wouldn't be that different. But it is, it can become even more important in the future. NAFTA was very important for offshoring, uh, much less I think the WTO accession of China was much more for the final goods. And there is a curious pattern there, which I don't understand, which is when you look at the China effects, they're very well identified on employment. Uh, David Otter and colleagues' work and some work that I have done finds very large effects. But inequality effects are more limited. Whereas when you look at automation, both the employment and the inequality effects are very commensurate with each other. So there's some puzzle there that I don't fully understand. Uh, Hernal, uh, that's a wonderful question. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to give a lecture at the AEA that's exactly on these issues, is when is it that the distortion, when the direction of technology is distorted. And, you know, uh, if markets are perfectly competitive and all of the other neoclassical assumptions hold, even if you know, firms are making the decision and they're looking at it from the point of view of the capital returns, the market's going to work out. But exactly once you deviate from these things, then there are going to be distortions. Distortions can be technological in nature. They can be because of this automation versus other things, again, in set settings in which not things, things are not fully competitive. And it also will be because of differences in markups. And in general, what I, going to your imperfect labor market comments, bargaining and so on, that's actually a topic of a new work that Pascual Restrepo and I have. And I think it's, there are some, lots of interesting things. One thing that we also emphasized in the past is that there's already a pecuniary channel that leads to excessive automation. I even had a slide on that, but I skipped it. In any labor market in which there is a difference between observed wages and the social opportunity cost of labor, efficiency wages, bargaining, whatever, firms are going to have automation incentives based on the wage. Social planner would like to do it on the lower social opportunity cost of labor. So there's going to be an excessive. But there are other interesting effects that come, much amplified rent reduction effects of which tasks you automate. 
In principle, there's another channel, which is exactly the one that you've pointed out, which is that you may also choose to automate in order to reduce <laughs> Not to reduce the rent directly, not to remove the rent, but you still keep the, you use the threat of automation as a way of increasing your bargaining power. I believe in that effect, but empirically it's hard to identify. Theoretically, it turns out to be also very tricky. Many models don't give that for a variety of reasons we can talk more about. Thanks, Darren. We have a very large virtual audience uh, for this lecture. Around 500 have registered. So I'm just curious whether there's a question for the, for the virtual audience. Not so far. So let's turn again to all of you. And let's have a sec of, uh, another round of three questions. There's one for Raquel there. Uh, let, 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 go ahead. Yeah. Maybe we just wait for the mic to arrive. Hi, Raquel Fernandez. Um, you know, I, you didn't mention uh, a 19th century uh, figure, uh, economist also in some sense, who would have said, well, it's obviously a question of who owns the means of production. And um, I never would have disagreed with you that technological change is endogenous. But why don't you think, aside from what government can do in terms of thinking about you know, taxing certain types of technology, what do you think about sharing those rents that come, not at the firm level, but at the society level? I actually don't agree with Marcela in thinking that social protection is going to be very helpful here, because I think this is just a problem that's going to be accumulating over time. So what schemes could you come up with, uh, not by giving people stocks, but directly via automation, which is what's lowering labor's bargaining power, uh, to rectify this problem, or at least help rectify the problem. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, no, uh, I think I'm supposed to take more questions, sorry. A couple of more questions, there are any more? Can't see. Okay, yeah, um, this one there, right? Rashid, yeah. And, yeah. But the back, okay. Very possible. I don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Do go ahead. Yeah. Thanks for a super interesting talk. Um, so, uh, as it has been mentioned before, the, the political economy problem is that firms mostly make this decision, this call of what technologies they want to develop, with some bargaining in the story. And, and I really like the the paper on green technologies that you mentioned. That really shows that it is feasible to provide some incentives that affect which technologies tend to be developed. I'm just afraid that the parallel for in this situation is not as easy and it requires a whole lot of information where and not only information but ability to predict as, as one of the quotes says maybe it will be a harsh time for 20 years but it will be worth it in the longer term and, and some of it is true. So how do you and in the meantime I guess one doesn't want to become China and, and as a government saying you have to develop this kind of R&D and not this. So how do you see a feasible way of reconciling the positive forces of market decisions for what R&D, where R&D should put its efforts, and this rectification. It seems like you convinced us that it's necessary, but you didn't give us what you think is the best solution now and feasible, uh, politically feasible, let's say. Thank you. There is a question at the back. I can't see very clearly the talk, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, is that right at the back? Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for the presentation. So I remember in your presentation you said many times uh, like uh, eventually everyone will be uh, better off for the advancement of technology. But I think um, everyone's bettering off is not the same as reducing equality because if the bottom are uh, better off for a little bit and the top better off for a lot, then actually inequality increase even though everyone is bettering off. Uh, bettering off. Uh, and um, another uh, comment of mine is, um, I think, uh, how do I put it? So inequality, uh, if, uh, if in the words of the British, it's the, uh, it's, it's the haves versus the have-nots. So when we say, will technology reduce inequality, so whose technology, right? So if the technology is, is eventually, uh, say, in the hands of uh, 
uh, a few number of people, then probably that wouldn't reduce inequality. If, if that sounds too much like a Marxism uh, economist, then uh, let me put it into the, uh, uh, like an international perspective. For example, 60 years ago, United States probably make everything from television to telephone to, to toys, right? Uh, but it's not because other developing countries 60, 60 years ago, they don't want to be, it's because they don't have the technology. But in the past few decades, first Japan, then China, and then now Vietnam, they, well, for one way or another, they start to have this technology to make all these manufacture things. So I think probably democratization of technology is what's eventually going to reduce inequality. Um, that's, what, that's just what I think. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Well, wonderful question. So let me start in sequence. Uh, thanks, Raquel. Uh, so in the book, we discuss the other half of that duo uh, angles a lot uh, because he had uh, uh, excellent analysis of uh, the living and the working conditions. Uh, you know, Marx actually did talk about automation, but his writings on that are a little confusing and confused, so uh, we don't get into <laughs> the other sort of issues you raise are absolutely right and important. So. Uh, I know you're asking this partly to be provocative and, and in an intellectual way, so I don't want to sort of say this in a negative way, but what you asked is exactly the Silicon Valley view. So there are many sort of semi-progressive uh, Silicon Valley leaders, including Reid Hoffman, who I mentioned, uh, 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 Eric Schmidt, uh, and, 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 and many others, who are very worried about automation and their solution is we should do all the automation that we can and then we have to find a way of sharing the benefits. And, uh, and I think the problem with that is, first of all, it's not an equilibrium in a political economy sense. Once you disempower labor, and I think taking away the most important things that people do in their jobs or their labor market presence, you're really disempowering them. Once you disempower labor, then it becomes very difficult to have very generous redistribution. And second, there is growing evidence, although controversial, that this isn't actually going to lead to a healthy society either. People, when they don't have a job, they feel very disenchanted, alienated, and <laughs> uh, so it has, so it seems like the most immediate thing, if it's feasible at all, and that's where the feasibility issue and Rashid's question comes in, steering the direction of technology in a way that keeps on creating jobs, meaningful jobs, better jobs, and that's the way to redistribute is, is much better. So the, the alternative, yet another alternative, but I think is not that different from the Hoffman, Schmidt, Zuckerberg solution, which is, well, you give some ownership of the means of production, and that's where your Marx reference comes in, and uh, to workers and they become rentiers. But I don't think that's really fundamentally different from social protection and redistribution doing it, because if they are, do that and they don't, they don't work, it's gonna be the same thing. And even if you promise that, are you gonna be able to implement it? Even if you implement it, once they start losing that, those shares, they sell them in the market, are you gonna give it back to them and what type of, so the political economy cannot be bypassed through those mechanisms. Rashid, that's an excellent question. So, uh, first of all, let me start by emphasizing I don't want any of my sort of uh, comments to be misunderstood in, the, in that I am, everything I said is not opposed to technology. It's all in the spirit of we want the technological change but we want the direction of technological change to be much more worker-friendly and consistent with shared prosperity. And moreover, again, showing sort of my neoclassical affinity, I don't think that you can have that technological progress by a very heavy state hand. So the private sector has to play a critical role. So then, put the two together, which is, I'm saying the private sector right now in the current institutional environment is generating highly distorted technology, but at the end you need technological change, you need the private sector, 
So the only feasible solution, you need a better institutional framework and that institutional regulatory framework to change the incentives for the direction of technology. Now, your, your question was extremely well put. It has two layers. One is, is it feasible technologically to steer direction of technology? And yes, I 100% believe that. Now, I don't have hard evidence, but digital technologies are so versatile. And so in the book, there is a you know, half a chapter devoted by many things that you can do with digital technologies that create new tasks, new platforms, new information for decision makers at every level of skills with examples that tries to bolster that case. But then you were raising the second layer. You know, in energy, it is possible to go to renewables or it's possible to go to fossil fuel. In digital, it's possible to go to automation and to worker-friendly technology. But you were raising the second issue in energy, it's easy to find which one is renewables. Although I, I can tell you, big oil companies are doing an amazing job of masquerading some fossil fuel technologies as renewables, but that's a different matter. But generally, I think it's, uh, it's feasible. And we admit in the book, and I admit here, it's much harder. You know, AI technologies, are they empowering managers to buy new tasks or are they empowering managers to cut the rents of workers? So there are many gray areas. So for that, uh, I think uh, specific technological choices, I think, would not have worked in the energy field. It would not, imposed by the government, would not have worked in the energy field. It won't work in... Uh, uh, in, in technology. But there are many other things that can be done. So one of the other chart slides that I removed, for example, is that right now it's not that we are creating a level playing field. We're actually in the US, and the same is true in most industrialized nations, the tax system provides a 20-25% subsidy for automation relative to hiring workers or increasing worker productivity. So the first thing is that you would create that, you would remove that bias. So that if that's not enough, I think what you have to do is set broad goals for labor-friendly technologies. And the role of workers uh, is much greater. So one model there is uh, Germany. So emphasizing that this is not just a global trend and choice is relevant. Germany is far ahead of the US in terms of robots, but it's embedded in a very different institutional structure. So uh, work councils are consulted with robot adoption. Unions, uh, uh, just like UAW did, uh, are very engaged in training for uh, workers after automation. So firms are, uh, can introduce robots, but then they, are, they choose or they're induced to retrain many of the workers so for fewer layoffs. And they also introduce other technologies that are complementary to humans in design, inspection, planning, where uh, internally trained workers take many of these jobs. So again, the sort of combination of gov government oversight, civil society pleasure, pressure, and workplace coordination, much harder in the US, but I think those would be solutions that at least can get us started. And, uh, and finally, you know, first a clarification point. Uh, uh, I'm sure you did not misunderstand me, but I, you know, when, I, when I said, ultimately everybody will benefit. I wasn't saying my own view. I was saying I was giving a caricature of not every economist, but a modal economist view and a view that follows from some economic models. And why do I focus on people benefiting rather than inequality? Well, actually, I think inequality matters as well. But even, uh, you know, Reid Hoffman's quote and other sort of Silicon Valley and, and many economists would agree that many of these technologies are going to increase inequality. So the claim isn't that you know, Zuckerberg and Elon Musk are going to benefit as much as the workers, but the workers are going to benefit as well. And I'm taking uh, exception to that view. So, so that's a sort of a stronger claim, and that's why I focused on that one. I'm not sure whether I understood the last part of the comment, but if you mean by democratization of technology, you know, technology going in a direction uh, that's sort of broader in its applications and is useful for workers, is useful for citizens, consumers, users. I think that's exactly what I am sort of talking about. And that's why, just like you said, a very important part of the emphasis is about the control of technology. But there's a lot of talk of democratization 
in Silicon Valley, that was, you know, Facebook and Twitter were going to democratize uh, communication and news sharing. You know, some of that is, is not, you know, not clear what democratization in general means in that context. Thank you. Just very quickly, in, in response to, to uh, Raquel's comment, uh, just, just a clarification that I, I, I don't think I said it, but, but I didn't mean to say uh, that social protection was going to be the answer. Uh, just picking up on, on, on the Ron's point that um, labor protection, social protection had been so important uh, uh, to keep control on, on the power of uh, firms uh, on, on employees, but I completely agree with you that it, is, uh, it has limitations. One of the limitations is whether we can pay for it and how we can pay for it, um, as I mentioned, but of course, it is also a very limited uh, tool to start with. I, I think all of the comments actually go in the way uh, of, uh, of pointing at the importance of generating income to start with, before uh, providing a social protection from the state. And most definitely, the design of the tax system is going to be uh, uh, crucial. Thanks, Marcella. It's time to bring this annual lecture to a close. I know we would like to carry on a little bit longer, but it's already almost 6 o'clock. Um, I, 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 I don't absolutely agree with you that we have to, as economists, not take technology not in a sort of optimistic way we do. But I think one key takeaway from what you said, and that's the probably the optimistic view on this, is that how do we deal with the worker-friendly technologies that are both create jobs or good jobs and are also productive, right? This sort of balance is so important. Uh, I think we would like all, I would like all of us to thank Darren and Marcella for the wonderful lecture and the wonderful comments. So let's just uh, thank them. In the Before I end, or we end this end of lecture, I should mention that UNU Wider has a very exciting project we just finished that looks at the role of technology, routinization, automation uh, on workers, on, on inequality, and also on the changing nature of work. This is a project that we have several research outputs on our website, led by Carlos Gradin and others, and Simone is also here. And do take a look at the, our publications because at, in our view, the first project one has done across where we have, like, we have some evidence on the effect of automation and organization on inequality and, 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 and job polarization and so on. So that's something we, I just wanted to mention. So let me stop ending here and say that uh, we, uh, I know many of you are here for, for uni even for the first time. I do hope you're going to sign on to our newsletter so you're going to get to know more about the work we are doing. And hopefully uh, we'll see you again in a, in a future uni event. We'll just not just. Thank you.